I would like to introduce Dr. Pratiksha Pallahe, who is right now currently heading National Facility for Biopharmaceuticals, uh, known as NFB. Uh, Dr. Pratiksha has completed her doctorate in Bioanalytical Sciences uni from University of Mumbai on the subject Bioremediation of Organic Solvents and its Analysis Using Bioanalytical Techniques. She has received a junior research fellowship at NFB, and uh, she's also been a co-investigator in projects submitted to DST by Khalsa College, um, which received a huge grant. The name of the project was Strengthening of National Facility for Biopharmaceutical Services for Bioprocess Training and Biopharmaceutical Characterization. Uh, Dr. Pratiksha has been recipient of different awards as well as she has uh, industry types such as known industries such as Team Made uh, India and Torin Pharmaceutical Private Limited, etc. She has successfully completed NIS sponsored projects such as in vitro screening model for hair growth by herbal formulations, evaluation of wound healing activity of taste compounds for determining its effect on post menstrual endometrium repair, in vitro model for studying of CO blast differentiation and cell proliferation activity of herbal formulations. So we can see that uh, there is a combination of biopharmaceuticals as well as pharmaceutical product, products in uh, Dr. Pratiksha's work. Uh, we would like to hear you uh, hear from you, Dr. Pratiksha, about biopharmaceuticals in detail. So, uh, very warm welcome to one and all. Uh, thank you so much for coming in on this beautiful day of International Women's Day. I wish you all a very happy Women's Day to everyone who has joined in this conference today. So first of all, uh, I take this opportunity to thank the organizers uh, from D.Y. Patil University, uh, Dr. Vijay Patil, uh, Mrs. Shivani Patil, uh, Dr. Rakesh Somani, Dr. Anaga Joshi, and Dr. Geeta Bhagwat for having me as a panelist for today's discussion. Um, it's indeed an honor to come back to D.Y. Patel. My associations with D.Y. Patel has been very long, almost about say 10 years now when NFB was actually conceptualized and got into existence. We are associated with D.Y. Patel since then with the Department of Pharmaceutics. So thank you once again for making me come back to the Institute. So, um, my topic for today's lecture is latest pharma and biopharma developments for human health. Now, first of all, Dr. Bhagwat, thank you so much for a very vivid introduction of mine. Um, as the head of National Facility for Biopharmaceutical, my uh, key role is basically to work on industry academia collaboration to facilitate and uh, uh, give a platform to the Indian students who are into the biopharma and pharma sector, where they can have a direct interaction with the industry and set up uh, and communicate so that they are more open and having a lot of opportunity for jobs. So um, started in 2012 uh, as a part of an initiative from Department of Science and Technology Government of India. NFP has been, uh, you know, as a forerunner of skill development in the biopharma sector. And um, coming today to speak on this topic on a Women's Day on the latest uh, developments in the uh, pharma and biopharma sector, I indeed feel that um, it is a very, very beautiful coincidence that this sector of pharmaceutical product development and biopharma product development in India was actually spearheaded by a woman. We all very well aware of her. Um, Dr. Kiran Majumdar Shaw. And uh, she's the one who got India on the global platform of biopharma and pharma. And uh, today talking on this topic of technological development, special perspective of uh, what are the growth opportunities in this sector, especially from students' perspective, what are the key areas where you can really focus uh, and I would say explore to understand uh, which are the key, key areas that may be the future or be, which may be the health of tomorrow. So I think it's a very, very beautiful coincidence talking on biopharma on a Women's Day. So to begin with, um, I think um, you all know, can you all see the woman in the slide? 
this beautiful picture is called as the glow of life and it is very evident that the whole glow that comes of life is through a woman um spiritually speaking or speaking through what our scriptures say women have always been considered as the epitome of growth development success prosperity uh, i would say business i would say um, you know uh, success so uh, women always have played a very very uh, strong role when it has come for uh, revolutionizing places and concepts and understanding how women can contribute into this sector i am sure the previous two speakers who have come have given you a very very strong insight into the capacities of a woman as a leader in the pharma and the biopharma sector to take it forward and i'm sure their stories must be inspirational for you in some way or the other where you can really work and move forward towards this development coming to the uh, content of the program my main focus uh, today will be to talk about the pharma and the biopharma sector the growth trajectory of these sectors over the years the processes involved in each of these sectors the technological innovations that have come up the future that each of these sectors hold and last i would talk a little bit about how nfb is contributing towards the growth and development of human resource in the sector so if you look the biopharmaceutical the pharmaceutical biotechnology plethora it's massive starting from dna vaccines at juvens diagnostic enzymes recombinant vaccines going all the way up to allied fields like agriculture uh you know nutraceuticals healthcare diagnostics medical devices environment marine you touch any natural form you will see a shade of biopharma or pharma in that in that field massive field lot of scope lot of growth but my experience as the head of nfb tells me that the students are not uh, very aware of the scope and the growth in these sectors Uh, if i may interrupt uh, uh, madam can you just tell me uh, what kind of a crowd do we have for today's presentation so accordingly i will have an explanation this webinar is basically for faculty pharmacy faculty and few others who have joined are from the industry so we have a uh, quite mature okay. crowd okay okay so uh, uh, so have in our syllabus pharmaceutical biotechnology as one of the subject introduced in the by the pci and uh, we would really like to know the scope and the latest and maybe the future about pharmaceutical biotechnology and biopharmaceutics in general so that is great. why you are one of the speakers invited for that topic. great great so i mean uh, we have a very mature crowd for today's uh, uh, you know the webinar uh, for your student perspective we will come back again to it because that will be too much into detail and in depth so i don't need to basically go on to ex explaining conceptual i'm sure the the team is very very well aware of that so basically from this uh, 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 diagram you can understand that the application is underscore understandings of what is basically pharma law of uh, pharma uh, pharma products and biological products pharmaceutical products and biological products so if you look at aspirin it's a very very uh, simple molecule of a benzene ring and an alcoholic group. but at the same time if you look at a biological molecule which is like trastuzumab you can look at the complexity that comes with the molecule in terms of the structure in terms of the activity in terms of uh, the chemical bonding in terms of uh, Uh, the solubility every everything changes so even though the biopharma and pharma may sound like uh, jargons coming com coming from the same word but they are way uh, diversified in terms of their activity in terms of the product development in terms of their um, r and d manufacturing there's a big 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 difference so moving forward if i have to explain to you in biopharma 
what exactly is the difference between biologics and biosimilar so here you can see two two pictures on the screen and if you look at an overview of these two pictures you would say that these two pictures are almost identical but then if you look closely you will see that there is a mild difference this mild difference may not seem logically important for you as a pitcher but when we talk about biologics a little difference like this can create drastic implications when it comes to uh, drug mechanism drug delivery drug stability drug activity so basically they are the same biological molecule but they are biosimilar they are not identical now biosimilarity basically would come in terms of either you are modifying the sequence of the amino acids or you are modifying the you know adjuvants or you are kind of uh, adding or removing or deleting molecules which we call as bioengineering so that becomes a very very essential part of drug development in biopharma if you look at the market sector it's a ever growing ever increasing market sector 2024 it's considered to be growing at rate of iind mein your japan supply iind alag alag hota hai na to hame india ka padhna hai ki iind kisi country mein padhna hi approval process india way se india ka padhna hai मैडम प्लीज म्यूट द पार्टिसिपेंट्स गीता मैडम प्लीज म्यूट द पार्टिसिपेंट्स और एक इंडिया का तो हमें जनरल वाले पढ़ने हैं खाली हाँ मैंने जो दिया है ना सीडी ईएसआर बराते मैडम बराते मैडम आई हैव आई हैव म्यूटेड ऑन सर madam can i continue yeah yeah sorry for the inconvenience you yeah. can continue yeah so if you look at the growth the growth is a very very trajectory based growth and there's a huge scope in these kind of sectors with the cagr of almost 9.3 which is going to be a multi billion dollar industry in the future ma'am i if you look at india as such uh the scenario is almost very similar to the global scenario india's uh, major revenue or major growth sector in india is going to be the biopharma in the future the bio services uh, contributing the next factor bio agriculture bio industries which today we talk about uh, say alternative industries for fuel biofuels uh, and uh, Uh, biological materials and then you have the bioinformatics sector which is currently at 1% but this is a very very promising sector which is planning to boom if you look at the r&d development cost for a biomolecule and uh, and as compared to a new chemical entity or new biological entity you can see that the amount of money that is spent in the r&d is tremendous tremendous in the sense to the tune of almost 3000 billion dollars if you put in so much of money so much of resources the average turnaround time for a development of a drug is almost say 8 to 12 years then obviously it shows the significance of this industry in the future it shows the need of precision and the need of coming up with world class quality molecules because what are we talking about we are talking about healthcare we are talking about molecules or this area of pharma and biopharma uh, no matter how vivid these uh, areas are they hold a very very essential and strong position in the development of healthcare sector not only as as an organization or as a country india but also as an individual where today all of us are struggling through lot of um, diseases lot of immunity disorders lot of pandemics we have all understood the importance of healthcare in the last uh, i would say a couple of years and that's how 
this whole process of development has become central uh, in uh, biopharma. If you look at the slide, basically talks biopharmaceutical drug development process, which is a very, very stereotypic process is a pharma drug where you identify the lead molecule, then you identify the compounds which can, uh, you know, uh, work on those target molecules, uh, establish an activity, which is most of the time a bioassay, do the clinical studies, go for a preclinical, clinical phase one to three trials, get your regulatory approvals, and then finally launch the product. Now, all of this, uh, if you look, may sound like a very, very, um, you know, a linear process. But each of this process has so much of interdependency that sometimes at the phase three clinic sufficiently capable of entering into the market. And the whole process downline of it needs to get modified. Now, this kind of um, seriousness that comes through the product development comes in with a lot of regulatory interjections. When it was pharma, it is relatively lenient. When it is biopharma, it becomes even more stringent because what are we talking about at the end of the day are biological molecules, biosimilars, mo and molecules which are humanized kind of molecules which resemble human beings. The activity of which is already established in the human body and you just have to replicate it as for the human process. Now the stringency becomes even more strict when you come to biosimilars, because what are you doing in biosimilars? Is you're basically modulating the natural biological entity to either enhance the activity of the molecule or to make it more efficacious or to make it better as a better drug delivery mechanism. So all these processes may sound very complex to you, may look very complex, but each of these processes have a very, very strong uh, regulation at each step. If you look at a biopharma product, a production process, it's very similar to a pharma production process where you have an upstream uh, processing, which usually comes not from a chemical entity or not from a synthesizable entity, but from a biological entity. Usually um, cell culture mediates or bacterial cultures if the product is successfully recombinantly cloned, coming to the mid DSP, where you upscaling the product in terms of expression and then doing a partial purification to make sure all the host cell proteins and host cell DNA is getting purified. A very close-knit, uh, you know, I would say a domino type of a purification process, which we call as a DSP, where a series of chromatographic techniques are applied for systematic purification of the molecule based on various chemistries like size, the, 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 the isoelectric pH, the binding molecules, uh, sometimes even the conjugates, the complex. So there are various chemistries on the separation of the molecule based on the kind of molecule that you're dealing with. And the final part that is basically the formulation, which talks more about stabilizing the molecule and uh, converting it into a formulation and lyophilizing it and getting it approved by the EFD for market circulation. If you look at an upstream process in a biopharma product development, it basically consists of two types. Can be a prokaryotic system where you're having a gene inserted into the bacteria expression and then purification. Or it can involve a eukaryotic system, which is basically talking about uh, cell lines uh, transfected with uh, you know, recombinant DNA and then expression, purification, the process remains. It's a lot and lot of biological applications, whether it is coming from the healthcare sector or agriculture or, uh, you know, GMOs, uh, environment, marine, zoology, biology, microbiology. So it's all across the field. Just to give you an example, uh, we have the recombinant finger nucleases which have been very, very successful in, you know, integrating genes in maize, tobacco, in human embryonic protein stem cells. Uh, we have three ZNFs which are in clinical trials for treatment of HIV. Uh, talents which are used in the production of biofuels for modifying the human embryonic stem cells for correction of in vitro defects, genetic disorders like xeroderma pigmentosum, 
to create knockout cell lines and transgenic organisms in C. elegans, rats, and zebrafish. Each of these um, is a topic by itself and would require at least an hour of explanation of how these transgenic models have been created and how they have been put into the practical use of either in drug identification as lead molecules or drug screening uh, uh, to understand the metabolism of drugs, uh, to have a high throughput models for understanding the efficacy of the molecules. So we can take these topics later on. Latest addition to this <coughs> technology is uh, the CRISPR-Cas9. <coughs> I think all of us are very aware of how the CRISPR-Cas9 is a, the latest gene editing technology. <coughs> One technology that has successfully got converted into a therapeutic uh, system. So in this, basically, you have a guide RNA, which is basically an RNA molecule, which is complementary to the gene that needs to get edited. It's, co it's combined with the Cas9. So Cas9 is basically the regulatory molecule, which will identify the gene. Guide will integrate with the gene. And this whole complex is like an alarm, uh, like a signaling molecule for the Cas9 RNA complex to come as uh, a nuclease and cut the cut the fragment. And then you have your recombinant fragment, which is your programmed DNA, which can get inserted into the gene and correct the defects. Now, this is a more targeted specific uh, technology, uh, having a lot of implications in uh, disorder, genetic disorders, or uh, I would say, uh, you know, autosomal uh, disorders, which can be corrected through a single, which are single gene disorders can be corrected through CRISPR-Cas9 technology. This technology has found a lot of applications in the food and farming industries uh, for in crop industries to increase the yield, drought tolerance crops, to identify and study genes in the East, to change the mosquito genetics so that they are not able to transmit malaria, which is one of, one of the major breakthroughs to make malaria resistant mosquitoes. And uh, obviously, one place where it has been really, really successful is in the treatment of sickle cell anemia, uh, which is a congenital disorder. Coming to the eukaryotic system, it's the same as uh, the prokaryotic system, where you have a clone DNA transfected into a mammalian cell. You grow clonal expansion of the cells, then you identify the clones through facts to understand which are the positive clones harboring your transgenic DNA and then a bioreactive process for overexpression of these proteins and purification, which follows the same DSP and formulation routine like pharma, pharma drugs. The latest addition, uh, all of you must have heard about uh, in this therapy is the CAR T cell therapy, which we call as, as the chimeric antigen receptor T cell therapy. A uh, beautiful technology which has revolutionized the healthcare sector drastically by providing, by able, uh, by able to treat diseases like cancer with almost close to 98% efficacy and uh, uh, more than five year long relapse rates. Technology is commercialized. It is now available uh, on, uh, on, in, on, even in India, we have the IIT Bombay professors who have commercialized this technology as the Indian technology of CAR T cell therapy. Very simple technology of where you draw out a patient's blood, separate the T cells. Then you have a virus, which is usually an inactivated virus, which has the genes of interest. You conjugate them with the patient's T cells. The patient's T cells will un, uh, re, uh, recognize the virus, make the necessary receptors, which are called as chimeric receptors, because they will have a part of their own T cell plus the part of the viral DNA. Now, these chimeric T cells, and once they reach a suitable number, they are transfected back, back into the human body where they are target specific, now driven to the target organ of the cancer, specifically hitting like a bullet over there. So this therapy is usually, if you look at the traditional therapies in cancer treatment, which involves chemotherapy and radiation or a combinatorial therapy. It's basically like, like uh, throwing hand grenades in the field. Now, what does that do? 
Throwing hand grenades in the field is a very non-specific way of targeting the disease where randomly the land is also destroyed, the plantations are also destroyed, the bio, uh, uh, the bio ecosystem is also destroyed along with the invader. But CAR T cell therapy is not a hand grenade therapy. It's a, it's a bullet therapy. It's an AK-47 therapy. Now in this therapy, what happens is you just target your uh, enemy, fix the target, and hit the bullet. So this kind of technologies have made it very, very evident that the level of innovation and the research that goes into making these kind of technology is something that doesn't happen overnight. It takes years and years of research and innovation. So I would say that if you consider healthcare as a profession in future, remember one thing, that innovation will not be easy in this sector. It requires time, energy, perseverance, patience, and a lot of responsibility. But remember, it will be a life-changing innovation. So unlike the IT sector, unlike the digital marketing sector, where innovations are happening in hours, it takes years for innovation in the healthcare sector, but it's definitely rewarding and worth it. Coming to the applications of CAR T cell therapy, it has been used to it is actually, a, uh, you know, it's from a lab to the bedside therapy. We have successfully been able to take it to the bedside. Patients across the globe are being treated on CAR T cell therapy. It, uh, diseases like hematological malignancies like ALL, CLL, MLL, solid tumors, breast cancers, sarcomas are actually getting cured using these therapies. You won't believe that CAR T cell therapy is actually now also being started as an Amazon service. So you will soon have a logistic group which is going to come down to your home, take your blood, separate the T cells, transport them in cold storage conditions to the companies making CAR T cells, grow them, get them back to you and inject you. So how you have a doorstep Amazon delivery you will be now having a doorstep delivery mechanism for your CAR T cells for the treatment of your cancers. We are predicting that this therapy should be able to expand and not only treat cancers, but other life-threatening uh, lifestyle-based disorders, provided we innovate and move forward in understanding the key components responsible for the causation of these diseases. Now, uh, coming to a broad overview of all kinds of therapies that are available, you have in vivo gene therapy. There is a list of drugs, a massive list of drugs you can see to the left, uh, which are used as an in vivo gene therapy drugs. They are basically uh, chimeric molecules, combinatorial molecules of RNA, DNA, or mRNA molecules, which basically are inserted into the patient where they go and integrate into the genome and cure the disease. So that's in vivo gene therapy drugs. Quite a lot of them are already in the market and successfully treating a lot of patients. Coming to the ex vivo gene therapy products where you have a donor whose healthy cells are cultured. Those cultured healthy cells are inserted into the patient. The patient's immune system is boosted. And then you have uh, removal of the cells, again, culturing and reinserting back into the patient. So this basically comes for your CAR T cells where uh, your own uh, cells are considered, uh, are removed from your body, cultured and reinserted back into your body. Over there also we have Chimera, we have Yescata, which have crossed, crossed global limits um, in terms of therapy uh, for treatment of various diseases. Uh, coming on the in vitro models, which have now been considered as uh, are in the process of being considered as gold standards for drug development, drug screening, and, and uh, drug efficacy evaluation. To top the list, we have something called as the 3D organoid models. Now, not only are these models, uh, I would say, uh, having a lot of implications in uh, drug development and uh, in therapy, but these models have now been started, uh, are being explored as, uh, as a potential for non-animal based testings in uh, preclinical and phase one clinical trials. 
which I believe is a very, very big step in the ethical uh, world of uh, saving animals undergoing clinical trials. All of you are coming from the pharma and the biopharma sector have an understanding of how many lead molecules enter into the clinical trials and how many lead molecules are actually coming into the market. You won't believe the numbers are astonishing. 98% of lead molecules are thrown out of the clinical trials in phase three of the clinical trials. Only 2% of the global molecules are able to enter into the market for successful therapy. Now, if the failure rates are 98%, why are there no modifications and changes made in the in the in in the uh, downstream processes which can increase the efficacy of the lead molecules coming into the market because as you have seen in my third slide i have given you an estimate of 300 billion uh, 3000 billion dollars being spent on an r d if you have anything that resembles a human body which is able to replicate the human body on a petri plate then obviously the money the time the energy and the efficacy can be modulated to a great extent for these lead molecules which are going to enter into the market. So the biggest innovation in this disruptive technology as we would call it as, is the 3D organoid models, where you basically consider the human embryonic tissues which are generally your fetal stem cells. You isolate your embryonic stem cells, you grow them in, in a 3D plate, in a 3D atmosphere with all the uh, nutrients. You have a patient from whom you take your induced pluripotent stem cells and you grow them along with your spheroids so you can basically replicate the, <clears throat> the human patient into the spheroidal model. You can also take his normal tissues like a liver macerated tissues or I would say even gums, teeth, any tissue that usually goes waste, placenta, cartilage, synovial fluid. These tissues can be cultured. The adult stem cells can be isolated and conjugated with these spheroids. The cancer tissues, the cancer stem cells, the C cancer stem cells, which are present in a very minute quantity within the cancer organs, can be con uh, conjugated with these tissues. Same thing goes with blood. Now, what is the beauty of this? Now, if you use an induced pluripotent stem cell, you can convert these organoids into any organ of your choice. So if you are having a, uh, if you are innovating on a drug which is working on, say, hepatocytes or drugs which are targeting the pancreas, then you can artificially grow these pancreas and hepatocytes in a 3D model using the embryonic stem cells and the induced pluripotent stem cells in a 3D model of a culture. If you use the normal tissues and um, take the stem cells and then grow it and convert it into an organoid model, what you basically can understand is the physiology of a normal tissue on how a normal tissue is actually working in the human body. In the cancer case, you can remove the cancer cells, convert it into an organoid tissue and try combination of drugs on this to really understand which is the right combination and the dose of the drug that can work uh, that can uh, work efficiently on this patient. Today, which we call it as personalized medicine, is basically an out is an outright of this of this technology. The beauty is that it aids the doctor in giving him a clarity and understanding of what kind of cancer it is, what is the staging. What are the drugs which are working? What are the drugs it is resistant to? And based on this, a very systematic treatment regime can be drawn for each patient, which will definitely have better outcomes in terms of patient treatment and reduction of side effects. Now, each of these organoids that you basically make will have structure and vasculature as normal, normal organs. But again, the question is, that for a multifactorial disease like diabetes, where multiple organs are involved, how would you use this model? 
So for that cases, you have something called as organ ownership or human ownership models, where each of these organoids that can be made by culturing the stem cells with the embryonic stem cells can be integrated into a network of tissues and embedded on a chip so that you can convert it into a human on a chip model. If you look exactly how these organoids are made, this is a classical way of how these organoids are made. When you're on the day one, you just have the cells embedded and day two, you can see that the whole vasculature is de developing and day six, you can see that the complete organoid is ready. It basically forms a complete organ of uh, you know, cells, vessels, tissues, inter-tissue inter matrix, and all the growth factors. So all these things are kind of embedded. You can see this, it is not a very, very tedious process. It's a very, very systematic in vitro process. Within six days, you have the organoids ready. Each of the organoids can then be used for studying the efficacy of the drug, the treatment protocol, try to understand the, the biochemistry that has gone into the disease, try to understand the integration of networks of how the extracellular matrix is combining with um, the, the, uh, the vessels and the cells and how they're impacting the growth, the progression of the disease. Uh, you can study cancer metastasis very efficiently using these disease models. So these disease models are not only very, very efficacious tools from the R&D perspective, but they also offer a great, uh, I would say a high throughput screening models for your lead model. Molecules or the drug discovery process. We almost have 50 to 100 lead molecules which we designed. So these models offer a very, very efficacious way of screening which molecule will get into the trial. And since these are human models, the uh, reproductivity of the results is very high when you come down to your phase two and phase three clinical models. Uh, so the application of these organoids are in biobanking patients derived organoids. You'll be surprised to know that a lot of people in, in the UAE are basically creating their organoid models of their liver and kidneys and biobanking them for future. They know they are a high meat eating um, population, red meat eating population. They will not give up on their dietary habits of uh, quitting meat. And they know deep down somewhere they will require a kidney transplant and a liver transplant because of their eating habits. So they have started biobanking their organs. You can convert them into disease models, like I just talked talk to you about uh, the organoids. Drug testing can be done, having an organoid chip where you can screen the drug and not only screen the drug, but also understand the epigenetic, um, uh, epigenetic evol evolution of the drug and also the uh, drug-drug interaction, drug-protein interaction, drug-DNA interaction, and the proteomic and the transcriptomic analysis. It can be used for a lot of biological studies of how a host and a microbe is interacting. So a lot of probiotics, prebiotic studies can be uh, conducted uh, using these models for developing probiotics and prebiotics, which is one flourishing in the future. And obviously these can also be used for gene editing technologies. The other technology that has come into the market is the bio, 3D bioprinting technology. Uh, Ma'am, I would just request you to uh, give me an indication uh, five minutes before time up so that I can modulate my um, presentation. So whenever you think the time is up. So engaging that I'm completely engrossed in the highly technical uh, knowledge you are giving us. So <laughs> I don't mind listening to you for half an hour. <laughs> I don't, I really don't know because see, this is the biggest, biggest disadvantage of having a webinar is because it's uh, so less human interaction. You really don't know what people are doing behind the cameras, whether they are really listening to you and they're engaged or whether uh, I have bored them and 
uh, been an uh, anesthesia to them. So I am <laughs> unaware of that. Yeah, it's uh, knowledge building a lot. And the thing is, you are talking about applications who are actually directly applicable to the pharma industry, such as uh, transgenic models, etc. And yeah. you know, to avoid the preclinical and clinical trials. So yes. in vitro, in vivo. So all these things are very much relevant to pharma industry. And I'm sure people are also engaged, like I, how <laughs> I am engaged. But uh, you can you know extend till 10 10 more minutes easily okay fine fine no worries i'll i'll uh, wind up so uh, wind coming up. to the 3d print whatever you talk but i can give you <laughs> yes. 10 to 15 minutes so you still sure. have 10 to 15 minutes more yeah sure okay fine okay fine i'll stick to my time yeah so in the 3d printing technology basically what you do is um, how you create the organs on a petri plate which will generally take time. I showed you the organoids getting developed within six to 12 days. 3D bioprinting technology has shortened the time span and it has got it into a few hours. The beauty of this technology is it uses the same system of how an organoids are developed, where you have a cell, where you have a biopolymer, which is basically uh, uh, acting like a matrix where the cells will get embedded. So it's, it's kind of replicating your tissue mesh or the tissue matrix of the human body and you combine the two and what you make is called as a biological ink or we call it as a bio ink now this bio ink is basically filled into a syringe and you have three chemistries by which this bio ink can get embedded to make a, a 3d uh, model just to give you an understanding this is how the machine of the 3d uh, bioprinting looks like uh, very classical, very small and uh, very uh, compact machine, but you will be surprised to know the kind of application that this machine is able to develop. And this is exactly how the bioprinting is done. So you can see the syringe and the green color into it. The green color is basically your induced pluripotent stem cells or say uh, or stem cells isolated from a human donor or stem cells cultured or uh, transgenic cells or even recombinant cells that you have designed or made. And what you basically have as a binding material is any kind of a biopolymer which is available into the market you mix it together you make it into a gel you make it as an injection system and you have a petri plate at the base you program a software wherein you can uh, kind of layer different different uh, cells if you look at for example if you look at the human skin it is made up of two layers it has the epidermis and the dermis the epidermis has a very different set of cells the dermis has a very different set of cells and vasculature. You can basically create this whole complex on a petri plate using a 3D bioprinter. And what you get at the end of it is what you can see on the petri plate in the left. This is basically a 3D printed ear, the human ear. So uh, this basically, it, it may look like just a, a piece of flesh to you, but it has been integrated with the uh, the cartilage with the cells, with the vasculature of exactly how a human ear should. For people having a hearing disease of a constricted lobe. So it has a lot of applications in, uh, in healthcare. Same way, uh, we have the 3D constructed uh, human heart valves. We have 3D constructed knee valves, uh, knee caps. Uh, India has its own uh, 3D constructed knee and heart valves. And that has actually brought down the cost of production of heart valves from say 15 lakh rupees per valve to 45,000 rupees per valve. So you can imagine how in-house production and in-house manufacturing has caused a drastic decrease in the cost and making healthcare available to every strata of the society. So this exactly is uh, the, the technology of the future. Now coming to what we are talking about the future. This is what we have in hand. What is the future that we are looking at? What is what is the ten? What is the decade of biopharma healthcare looks like? It's based on artificial intelligence, and artificial intelligence is basically uh, an intelligence system based on 
inputs derived from human beings and making a predictive model to understand what the human beings can't understand. I'm sure most of you <coughs> over here must have not identified the spelling mistake in the word intelligence. It's a very, very minute mistake, but most of the time as human beings, we will overlook this and we will take it, we'll ignore it and move ahead because the human brain is programmed in such a way that you are supposed to overlook the, uh, the mistakes and move forward. But this is not the case when it comes to artificial, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence will even identify the, the minutest mistake that a human being is capable of making. And identification, rectification, and improvisation is what artificial intelligence is looking at. So if you look at artificial intelligence in the big way, what are the arms of the artificial intelligence? It's basically machine learning, deep learning, predictive analytics, and big data. I really don't want to get into the details of this because this, again, itself is a very, very massive topic, having a lot of intricacies. But to give you an overview, it basically, what it does is it integrates all the machines together, captures data from all the machines, makes a sensible story out of that data, and presents that story to you as a solution to all your problems. So machine learning is basically integrating data. Deep learning is analyzing the data. Predictive analytics is basically developing a software which can predict the outcomes of this data. And once this big data that comes into your hand is massive, it's, it's, it's enormous. It's, uh, I, I can't even express in words the, the kind of data, the management of that data. So this basically is the key role of artificial intelligence. What does artificial intelligence do as compared to other technologies that we have? It promotes innovation. Now, how does it promote innovation? It basically will improvise the drug design and development process by making small molecules. It will give you a predictive analysis of how the small molecules are categorized and based on that, it will give you the lead molecules that can basically uh, act as molecules for the treatment of a particular disease. It will also help you identify novel targets, novel molecules for diseases. Uh, it will not only uh, identify, it will also help in validation. So it will run some algorithms and some data based on all the previous clinical trials of drugs with similar categories and give you a predictive analysis of how, whether this molecule, if it gets into the market, how it will behave, what will be its metabolism, what will be its absorption, what will be its excretion profile. So ADME studies, instead of doing it on humans, can now be done on a machine. It reduces the turnaround time. Like I told you at the start of it, we have almost eight to 10 years before an NC comes into the market. Using artificial intelligence, the lead time can be reduced to almost three years. So you can imagine that $3,000 billion spent over eight years can now get reduced to about a few million dollars in a term of three years. So more lead molecules can come into the market. A greater uh, spectrum of treatment protocols and a greater spectrum of alternatives uh, can be generated for human beings. It increases the productivity of a process. So if you look at artificial intelligence, it not only looks at drug development uh, or uh, drug characterization, but it also looks at a complete portfolio of drug development. So it can predictively tell you that if you reduce the pH, the molecule will perform better. If you increase the adjuvant concentration, the molecule will perform better. If you have a reducing agent into the, uh, into the system, it will perform better. So what happens in this is the productivity and the efficacy of the value of the molecule gets enhanced and you're able to get a better quality molecule into the product as compared to human intervention. It adds value proposition to the company. Obviously, AI-based companies are the new emerging trend. Uh, those companies which are claiming to use artificial intelligence in their process are having very high valuation in the market. It makes the process very cost-effective. Uh, you can eliminate a lot of 
steps in R and D, a lot of steps in purification, a lot of steps in the manufacturing, a lot of steps in the supply chain can be eliminated by having a predictive analysis. So thereby you can reduce the cost of the operations and obviously the cost of the molecule that gets into the market. And it also adds business efficiency. It has an application in many fields like drug, drug discovery, drug development, manufacturing, supply chain management, disease prevention, diagnostics, epidemiological predictions, clinical trials. So basically you can predict epidemiology, looking at how a disease is spreading and what rate it is spreading and what population it is spreading. AI will give you a projection that in the next two days, three days, five days, the disease is expected to spread in this area with this much severity and this much um, uh, damage. So it, it basically gives you a lot of information, all that information that as human beings, we'll not be able to process, or we don't have the capacity to process that kind of big data. It also reduces the turnaround time uh, it, uh, because it increases uh, the efficiency of clinical trials. It also helps in reducing the side effects of the drugs, gives you an understanding of if there is any side effects. So multiple benefits of artificial intelligence. You can, in this slide, look at all the companies, the startups, the established companies, the IT companies that are getting into AI and ML in a very, very big way because they believe that this is going to be the future of therapeutics very soon. So to conclude my talk, I would like to tell you that the pharma and the biopharma industry is an ever-growing industry. Health will always be the prime concern of any government organization because it impacts not only the political structure of a country or a state, but it also impacts the overall growth economics of any country. Huge amounts of money are being spent on healthcare and uh, development of infrastructure like hospitals, primary healthcare centers, and government is investing huge amount of money. Obviously, if they are able to reduce the load on the healthcare, there'll be better profitability into the whole system and better growth prospects for the government. So government's prime focus has always been healthcare. It is a beautiful science where you can see an amalgamation of all kinds of sciences. You can see how IT has got into the pharma. You can see how uh, technology and uh, uh, you know um, machine learning has got into the pharma. You can see how biology has got into the pharma, how pharma has impacted every sector of the world. And it has given a significant impact on the healthcare, not only in India, which is one of the major concerns because now we have become the largest population in the world with almost uh, you know, close to 60% of the population below the healthcare standards. And um, to tackle such a huge population, we need better infrastructure, better technology, cheaper technology, um, good logistic system. You should be able to reach to the remotest part of the country at the shortest period of time. This industry also has offers a lot of entrepreneurship possibilities, which I have listed through my whole talk. I have told you at every step, what are the possibilities of entrepreneurship? and how you can grow this business multifold. Uh, not only because you have a huge market of healthcare sitting there, but also on a societal impact. Uh, okay, so coming to NFB, um, uh, I have almost completed my presentation. Um, so this is my team at NFB. I have junior research fellows, senior research fellows who work with me on development and technology. This is our uh, social media handles. You can get in touch with me on these social media handles. And uh, to conclude, I would just like to say that God made man and then he made a wow man and said that the wow man should be converted into a woman. And that's how the woman was born out of a man. So I believe that the superiority of uh, the man race is the woman of today. So thank you very much uh, for patiently listening through me throughout the session. Uh, if you allow me to uh, share a small video, ma'am, of my lab, I'd like to play a small video. Do we have time? I, do I have a minute? Yes, we have five minutes. You can share the video. So I'll just uh, you. show you that this year we are celebrating the 10th anniversary at NFB. 
with our goals being to establish an interface between industry and academia, to set up a biocharacterization lab, to set up in vitro based models. We offer a lot of services to the Indian uh, industries and students like R&D, collaboration, consultancy, testing, production. <clears throat> we are also focused on uh, providing research support to the students, providing certificate courses, collaborative seminars and conferences, on-campus training programs, hands-on training programs. This is the facility that we have in, right here in Mumbai, uh, sponsored by the Department of Science and Technology. So this uh, facility basically started in 2012 uh, with a grant of 3.85 crores from the central government with an add-on grant of 5.85 crores in 2019. Uh, we have a common instrumentation lab, which has uh, machines like the UPLC, weighing balances, UV visible spectrophotometers, gradient RT-PCRs, uh, DNA sequencers, and uh, we provide training on all these kinds of machines. We have a protein characterization lab which is well equipped with machines which are used for protein characterization uh, uh, and uh, protein purification. We have the gel docs, the protein purification systems, uh, ELISA readers. We have in the molecular biology lab, we have complete cloning facility with RT-PCRs, PCRs, gel docking systems. We have uh, our animal tissue culture lab where we do all kinds of uh, 3D, 2D in vitro models, developing 3D in vitro models right now uh, with uh, our liquid nitrogen tanks, inverted microscopes, uh, CO2 incubators, uh, visualizers. We have a microbiology lab which uh, where we conduct all kinds of studies. Uh, we have a five liter fermenter, a 21 liter scale up fermenter, uh, which is used for doing all kinds of bacterial and nutraceutical scale up studies. We have our chillers, compressors and other, uh, other ancillary equipments for support. So this is the basic infrastructure that we have in NFP, which is open for students. We provide hands-on training program on these nine topics, uh, which are complete end-to-end -end biosimilar production and characterization. We have a lot of industry collaborators with whom we work on industry related projects. You can stay connected to us. We have our social media presence on all handles. Um, all this will give you information about our upcoming workshops, our upcoming training programs, upcoming conferences, uh, seminars, workshops can be basically understood through our social media. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions that the team has uh, on anything that I have spoken about uh, in my presentation or any general information that they wish to know uh, from me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pratiksha. Uh, participants, do we have any questions? Uh, we are almost getting close to the close timing. Yeah, yeah, so I have a question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Please, please ask me. Today about the uh, concept of biopharmaceuticals and important uh, uh, as a biopharmaceuticals person is doing. My question is that how a pharmacy institution, you know, as you, you probably know that this particular session is being planned by the Women's Forum of Association of Pharmaceutical Teachers of India and the DY Party School of Pharmacy. That is right. in collaboration. And so majority of our attendees uh, yes. must be women also. So my question is, how, how can we collaborate with you for the training and uh, you know uh, 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 capacity building of the faculty member, particularly the women? Uh, uh, it would be great if you can throw some light on that. Sure, sir. My pleasure. So uh, we uh, are open to collaboration through an MOU uh, between us and the parent organization, whoever wishes to collaborate with us. We have uh, MOUs with various academic institutes already in place. And uh, these MOUs give us scope to jointly conduct training programs, workshops, seminars, conferences, 
uh, research related activities, internships, dissertation, PhD programs. So there are various modules on which we can collaborate. It depends on uh, the mandate of the host institute, how they would like to collaborate with us. That is one. Second thing, uh, we are already associated with the Maharashtra State Faculty Development Academy, MSFDA. Uh, under this MSFDA, we conduct training programs for biological science teachers and faculty members across the state of Maharashtra, even in the Mofusul areas. So you can uh, log into MSFDA and understand how our programs are being conducted and uh, either enroll through MSFDA for these training programs or have a joint collaboration and uh, sign an MOU and have these training programs if you're looking for a routine um, activity like an all round the year activity uh, then you can have an mou otherwise uh, we have uh, our training programs uh, already on our social media so you can attend any of those training programs based at your convenience oh that is great so we would like to go ahead with such kind of MOU with the uh, maharashtra state apti you know where uh, where our faculty members across the state of maharashtra get benefit of it so probably uh, we will connect with you separately and take this forward. And sure. as you rightly said that uh, uh, the Faculty uh, Development Academy, FDA, Maharashtra FDA, uh, if you're already partnering with them, then that would be, uh, which is located at Pune, obviously. Yes. So yes. Uh, we, we can certainly do some activities there also. Absolutely. So uh, please, yeah, please help us on that because sure, we sure. want to empower, empower our faculty members, the pharmacy teachers across the state of Maharashtra and yes. your help would be a great support kind of thing for us. I'll be more than happy, sir. We can connect separately on how you can associate with all the training programs. Yes. MSFDA. There are about 40 institutions associated with MSFD, which are doing training programs across various uh, uh, diaspora. Basically, they are looking at uh, uh, gender sensitization training programs, leadership training programs, capacity building training programs training programs which are uh, on peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, uh, which are mm -hmm. on uh, pedagogy-based analysis, and obviously skill-based training program where we partner with them for uh, providing skill assistance. So uh, we can uh, obviously uh, discuss this uh, beyond the forum on how uh, your faculty can uh, take advantage of all these training programs which are lined up. So basically, Thank you. Thank you so much. the registration fee would be about 1,000 rupees for each faculty. Uh, 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 train, uh, housing and accommodation and local hospitality will be provided for the training program. And um, that's it. Uh, the rest of the rest, all the fees will be paid by MSFDA. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Gita, madam, please take it further. I would like to thank Dr. Pratiksha on her really completely technological talk which she had uh, today with us. I would also like to thank her for uh, reminding us of uh, the pioneer in biopharma, Dr. Kiran Mujumdar Shah, which, which is also a lady. And uh, further, she explained about different applications of biopharmaceuticals and specifically to our, uh, of our concerns such as artificial intelligence, which would be the future, and currently 3D printing and 2D printing technologies, which would reduce the time of drug development and discovery, uh, as well as it will reduce the usage of animals as well as human subjects in preclinical and clinical trials. So all these things are really, really, very really important and helpful to pharma sector as well. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pratisha, for enlightening yes. on uh, such a, a technical talk. Uh, we are really thankful to you and we would definitely like to collaborate with you as Dr. Somani sir has also suggested. My pleasure, my pleasure. Uh, can you stop sharing, madam, so that I can share yes, my yes. Um, uh, Yes, ma'am. this uh, we are coming to an end of our uh, session all the three sessions by the women in technology can you all hear me yeah yeah just madam Gita madam any uh -huh. any uh, concluding comments by Dr. Anaga Zoshi madam if she can before we yeah. close the session definitely yeah. I could see her uh, Dr. Zoshi would you like to yeah she's good
right? Uh, yeah, actually, all the three sessions were excellent and uh, they were informative as well as uh, thought provoking. That is where uh, we can introspect on, you know, uh, what uh, knowledge base we do have and we can at the same time explore different opportunities or the, their pathways are so directive, all the three women, whatever they have shared. And we are really uh, grateful on behalf of uh, APTI uh, Women's Forum uh, Maharashtra State for the same. And uh, yes, looking forward for uh, many other sessions, uh, similar sessions from you all. And uh, like, I don't think that this is an end of the, uh, like this may be the end of webinar technically, but our relation will be definitely there in the future, which will be helpful for all the participants. Thank you. I would like to request all the participants to once uh, turn on their uh, video so that we can take a quick picture, all of us together. At outset, I would also like to thank D.Y. Patil University School of Pharmacy to give us the platform to host the Women's Day celebration today. I sincerely thank Dr. Vijay Patil and Mrs. Shivani Patil for giving us this opportunity. I thank the principal, Dr. Rakesh Somani, sir, who has been always an inspiration and who is also a president of APTI for allowing us to collaborate with the Women Forum APTI. Uh, nevertheless, I would like to thank Dr. Nagar Zochi, convener APTI Women's Forum, uh, for coming today and gracing the session. I thank all the staff members of DIP, uh, DIP Patil University School of Pharmacy, to be with me to make this workshop a big success. Uh, to name a few, Ms. Uh, Neeta Patil, Mr. Sanket, Dr. Chefali Thakkar, and others. And a big thank you to all the participants again or to come and participate in such a big number. I got around 300 registration, which was a huge number uh, to, I mean, you know, it was really overwhelming for me. I'm sure all the participants have benefited from the sessions by all the selected three women in technology. And uh, I would again like to thank all the three women in technology today who have really, uh, you know, given us thought-provoking thought sessions and enlightened the participants. We would like to have you all again in person in our college campus, as Dr. Rakesh Subhani sir has suggested, to uh, give guidance to our students. Uh, I must say that, you know, all, through all these sessions, all the participants who are faculty members can uh, always inspire your students to start entrepreneurship, to, you know, get into innovation and learn about the latest technologies as uh, Dr. Pratiksha has told us about the artificial intelligence and 3D printing, etc. Thank you very much for being with me. Happy Women's Day to everyone again, once thank again. You, thank you thank so you. much for hosting us. Thank you. Bye. Thank Take you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.